Today's workshop is on news literacy. My name is Evelyn. And I am one of the librarians at Santa Monica College. So what actually is news literacy? News literacy is the ability to use critical thinking skills to judge the reliability and credibility of news reports, whether they come via print, television, or the internet. And what exactly is news? The definition of news is information about recent events deemed to be interesting, important, or unusual enough to be newsworthy, or fresh information about less recent events that is gathered, verified, and structured in accordance with journalistic norms before being published in media ranging from newspapers to live blogs. You are already probably familiar with news being presented to you in the form of stories you read in newspapers, magazines, see on websites, listen to on radios, watch on television, or even hear in person by word of mouth. But when you look at this definition, please be aware there, that there are expectations that the information has been checked and verified within specific journalistic norms. If you take a look at this page, you can see here are some essential features of quality journalism. It is important to mention that when professional journalists make mistakes, they are expected to retract, correct, or apologize within a timely manner. So if you were to look here, these are some qualities that journalists are aware of when they report the news to us. If you want to take a better look at this, we can go to the Society of Professional Journalists and look at their code of ethics. So when journalists report their news to us, they have to do so in an ethical way. Basically, what they must do is seek truth and report it. Minimize harm. Act independently. And be accountable and transparent. As you can see here, members of the Society of Professional Journalists believe that public enlightenment is the forerunner of justice and the foundation of democracy. Ethical journalism strives to ensure the free exchange of information that is accurate, fair, and thorough. An ethical journalist acts with integrity. So these are the principles that are the foundation of ethical journalism. Why is news important to a democracy? The reason it is important is because shared knowledge is required for public discourse about politics and society. When people want to be, we want our people to be knowledgeable about current events. When people learn from accurate news sources, they are better able to make informed decisions within a democracy. So where do people go to get the news? As you can see here, there are different sources that the information comes from. You can see people get news from social media, such as Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube. They can also get their news from podcasts. People also get news from news aggregators like Google News or Apple News. People also get their news from cable. TV news or radio broadcasts, and they also get their news from newspapers, such as 
uh, online articles or actual print in print. But you should remember that wherever you choose to get your news from, that there should be the hallmarks of quality journalism that we just reviewed when we looked at the code of ethics. When it comes to different media outlets that we get our news from, you can see that there is often a bias in how the news is reported. If you look at this chart by all sides, you can see it is organized from left to right. So from the left, it's these are news outlets that are more liberal. And then as you go towards the center, they're not as biased either way. And then when you go to the right, they're more conservative. It's a human tendency to tend to dismiss sources that have a different bias from our own bias. So what that means is if I see something that is opposite to my belief, I tend to think that that information is false. When you look at um, all sides, you can see that they are able to rate these media outlets um, through surveys, independent reviews, and third-party research. We can go visit it right now. So how this is presented to you is it's the same story, but it's told three different ways from three different points of views. So here's the first story. Federal Reserve raises interest rates again amid bank troubles. If you wanted to see what the left had, the left point of view, um, you, can, you can click here and the news outlet is Yahoo News. If you want to see what a center media outlet, uh, how they see the story, how they see and present the story, um, you can read this one from the Hill. If you want to see how uh, a news outlet that has a right uh, leaning bias, you can read this story from Fox Business. So again, this is the same story, but told in three different points of views. This is a Pew Research Report that illustrates how our own biases affect how we interpret the news. So again, um, people tend to, depending on which bias they have, they tend to find the news that, that matches their point of view, that favors their side as factual. And if it's opposite to what they believe in, they see it as incorrectly, as a, in, incorrect information and simply uh, see it as opinion. And you can see this happens often um, when politics is involved. Here is another media bias chart. It's similar to the chart that we saw uh, previously, where it ranks the media outlets from left all the way to the right. But it also adds another element. You see that it also uh, have has them listed vertically up and down. So you can see. When something is, the higher up something is right here, the more uh, fact reporting, the more reliable that news media outlet is. And the lower it is, um, the more, the less accurate 
and the more tendency, there's a tendency that the information is fabricated. If we go to visit um, the Ad Fontes Media website, you can see uh, it's interactive. So you can actually type in the media outlet source that you're interested in researching, and it'll tell you where it's placed within this chart. The next thing to talk about is fake news. Media experts define fake news as factually false information delivered in the context of a supposedly true news story that is deliberately designed to deceive readers or viewers. You can see that fake news Prior to 2014, it was rarely used and it was mostly applied to satirical sites. But more recently, around 2016, you could see that you would hear news stories can be called fake news. And these were stories that had absolutely no truth in them, such as Pope Francis endorsing Don Donald Trump. And Donald Trump uh, later on redefined it, ma making it uh, more of a term that news media outlets use to make him look bad. So they purposely made things up to make him look bad. So why is the term fake news problematic? This is simply a genre of disinformation online, and it can be used by critical political actors as a label to delegitimize news media, and it can also simply be used to dismiss something as negative or false. Nowadays, Scholars tend to prefer to use the terms misinformation or disinformation. They find it more useful. Um, the definition of misinformation is typically describes falsehoods of fact that are spread either purposely or accidentally. And disinformation, on the other hand, always refers to information specifically designed to mislead or deceive consumers to influence their attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. If you look at this page, you can see Claire Wardle, who's a scholar, she doesn't like the term fake news because it was being weaponized by politicians in a way to attack the media. Instead, if you look at this chart, she prefers people to use misinformation and disinformation. And you see this is also uh, spread out in the spectrum. So from low, it would be satire or parody, which has no intention to harm, but has the potential to fool, all the way up to high, which is fabricated content, which is new content that is 100% false and designed to deceive and do harm. So social media and the news is an, an important relationship. You can see that social media platforms such as Facebook have a dramatically different structure than previous media technologies. Content can be relayed among users with no significant third party filtering, fact checking, or editorial judgment. An individual user with no track record or reputation can in some cases reach as many readers as Fox News, CNN, 
for New York Times. A little over half of U.S. adults say they get their news from social media, often or sometimes. And you can see here that uh, social media platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok are not news publishers. They simply serve as a gateway to news content. And the problem with this is people don't realize that they are not uh, news publishers. When they see a, a post from their friend, they say, my friend posted it, and that's good enough for me. Here is this, uh, an example that a lot of us are familiar with. Uh, in early 2022, the, there were a bunch of Facebook groups that would talk about the election results. And so many of these narratives were being spread that you can see that it caused the people to react in a way that resulted in the violence on January 6. So you can see that there are actual real world consequences to these this type of uh, distri distribution of disinformation about the election. Here is a chart from the Pew Research study, and you can see it shows that 66% um, of US adults use Facebook, and 31% of them will get their news regularly from Facebook. And you can see how social media does have a big impact on how people get their news. Um, and younger people, um, they tend to use Snapchat or TikTok. Something you should be aware of are algorithmic news feeds. Social media platforms have more control than you may realize over your news feed. There are Algorithms are designed to increase your engagement in the form of likes, shares, and comments. An algorithm will promote disinformation and misinformation as readily as it promotes legitimate news as long as it engages us. So you may have noticed when you visit a certain website uh, you'll be asked if you agree to accept cookies and you have the option to accept or deny the cookies. What they are doing is tracking your online behavior. They want to see what you are interested in and they purposely give you information within that specific topic. And the result is that it narrows your exposure to a variety of ideas and perspectives because it knows what you want to see, and it shows you exactly what you want to see, and only that. And the overall effect is that it reduces the accurate and shared knowledge that we all have in common in society. Here we have a slide that asks us, what role does advertising play in this news ecosystem? So social media platforms want to engage, you to engage with their platforms to show you as many ads as possible. And the news sites, whether credible or unworthy, are funded in part by these ads. And ad brokers, mainly Google and Facebook, want to place ads. Advertisers have limited control over where their ads are shown. So Basically, new, 
mainstream news media outlets want to encourage you to share the content with your followers, with your friends. The more people see it, the more ad, the more people see the advertisements, and the more money the advertisers make. Here is a video that il illustrates how disinformation publishers can make money using the advertising ecosystem. Let's watch it. New Dove Body Wash for skin conditions like eczema prone, hyperreactive, and dry cracked skin. With dermatologist approved ingredients. Help care for skin conditions in the shower. In the shower, discover New Dove Body Wash. At the start of 2016 in a small town called Bellas in Macedonia, an 18 year old high school student discovered that he could make more money than his parents by building fake news sites. To protect his identity, we'll call him Boris. And here's how he did it. He wrote tons of false articles about the U.S. election, most of them salacious. The articles were shared on Facebook, garnering tons of traffic. So much so that Boris's most popular website earned him $16,000 over the course of a few months. That's way higher than the average monthly salary in Macedonia, which is $371. So Boris dropped out of high school. And he was not alone. In the final weeks of the election, there were more than 100 political websites registered to Bellis. The most popular stories were pro-Trump, but that's not because Boris and his fake news publishers liked the campaign. They just liked the money. Trump supporters just happened to be more likely to share fake news. Researchers tracked 30 million shares of pro-Trump stories on Facebook in the months before the election. But why were companies advertising on fake news sites? They weren't directly. Those ads were placed by services like Google AdSense or AppNexus, which act as intermediaries between advertisers and small-time publishers like Boris. They negotiate how much ads cost and manage payments from advertisers to publishers. Those ads follow people wherever they go online. Remember when you recently searched for that onesie? Well, that search was tracked and matched with advertisers selling that product. So everywhere you go on the web, a onesie ad follows. Advertisers and these services create blacklists of sites they won't advertise against. But it's hard to keep up. So sometimes they pop up on fake news sites that haven't been discovered yet. While Boris and his friends were making money, fake news became one of the major scandals of the 2016 elections. Many wondered if sites like Boris's even helped Trump win. A joint study by NYU and Stanford University found that it may not have tipped the election as much as one would think. It found that one fake news story would need to be as persuasive as 36 TV commercials to swing a voter. Still, the backlash forced tech giants like Google and Facebook to do something. Facebook is now partnering with fact-checking organizations like Snopes and PolitiFact to flag articles that present deliberately misleading content. Google now cuts off AdSense revenue to sites with spoof domains like NewYorkTimesPolitics.com. But that's still flagging fake news after it's been published or shared. So tech companies like Moat propose combining algorithms with human insight to catch fake news before it spreads. Okay, so the next video we will see is a fake news generator who starts viral misinformation. Hey, it's Will Buy Your Car Week at AutoNation. Get top dollar right now. Visit AutoNation.com or see us for an easy appraisal. Get a check on the spot or get paid the same day with Zell. Don't wait. The time to sell your car to AutoNation is now. Want to know why coronavirus started? Or what might cure it? Well, search online and you'll find thousands of answers, many of which aren't true. I investigate disinformation at the BBC, and I'm often asked, who starts these rumours and who spreads them? Well, as always, the answer isn't straightforward, so I've broken them down into five different types. <laughs> One, the Joker. Lots of people have been sharing funny posts and memes online. 
Some of them are pretty good, but others go too far and people actually believe that they're true. Two, the scammer. This lot are looking to make money from the pandemic. Some create fake texts trying to get hold of your bank account details. Or others plug dodgy advice looking to sell their remedies and cures. Three, the politician. The people in charge can also spread fake news. That includes officials and citizens media from around the world. Officials in China and the US have been trading this information since the start of the virus. Each accused the other of deliberately creating it. Of course, neither of them is really true. And there are concerns about foreign interference. That's when states spread misleading information abroad in order to further their own aims. But it can be very difficult to trace interference back to the people in charge or to figure out who are behind networks of fake accounts that are pushing this information. Four, conspiracy theories. These people think that nothing is as it seems. They've falsely linked 5G to coronavirus, speculated about who created it, or even suggested that the coronavirus doesn't exist at all. None of these are true. These ideas have been bouncing around on the internet for a while. They've started getting more attention as worried people look for quick answers to their questions. Five, the insider. This information that apparently comes from someone you trust, an unnamed doctor, professor, or hospital worker. But it turns out they don't exist. Or if they do, it seems to be a game of Chinese whispers gone wrong. And this misinformation goes viral because it's shared, often by a relative in your WhatsApp group who passes it on just in case, or by a celebrity who amplifies it to their thousands of followers. Tech companies, media regulators, and governments decide what happens when people start and spread misinformation. But ultimately, we're all responsible for stopping its spread. Check out our top tips for spotting and stopping misleading stuff online. And think before you share. Okay, so now we will talk about how disinformation deceives you. Uh, the first thing it does is it, it appeals to your emotions. If you think about it, people will share things that either make them really happy or angry. So try to take emotions out of it when you share your information. Um, there's also a patina of credibility. Um, just because there's a little part of it that has some truth in it, you have to ask, is it really plausible? Um, fake news, uh, fake social media accounts also uh, are run by bots, which are computer pro programs that uh, trick us, basically. They use algorithms uh, to have, to make people believe certain things by creating fake shares, likes, or comments. So you think that a lot of people are interested in this. It's a very popular topic, but in truth, it really is just a bot that's doing it. There's also the illus illusor illusory, illusory effect, the truth effect, illusory truth effect. And basically, it says that repetition makes it seem true. If you hear the same thing over and over and over again, it's possible it's true. And finally, there's confirmation bias. So if the information that we receive is similar to our point of view, we tend to believe it automatically. So how does the information affect us and we affect it? If you look at this page, you can see We start with confirmation bias. So as the person is doing their research, they find exactly what they're looking for, so they stop, because it confirms exactly what you believe. Then there are filter bubbles and echo chambers. And this is when the algorith algorithms see what your search terms are, and then they work, and then they try to create a filter bubble so that's the information that you see because that's the information that you're searching for.
So then you get at a point where it is information overload. You only get the algorithmic feeds um, that you're searching for. So this is exactly something that you are believing in. These are the stories that you already find true. Th these are the brands that you like. This is everything that you believe in already. And then towards the end, uh, people tend to just uh, stop. The stop. They just tend to avoid the information uh, because it's just too much at this point. So we stop researching. We stop looking past the um, past what the information is, is given to us. We don't go further. A way to avoid this is try to do lateral reading. So what this is, uh, this is a technique that say you, you see a story in your news feed and then uh, you want to uh, question whether it's a credible source or not. Uh, basically what you have to do is go outside of that website or it's outside of the source to actually check. Um, here's a video and you can learn more about lateral reading. I want to take all stress out of the work experience. Let's have the app ready when I'm back. That's a problem. Look, you guys need to wait. If I have a class, I can do How are you taught to evaluate the credibility of online sources? Everyone knows that the information on the web may be shallow, incomplete, inaccurate, or heavily biased. And many of us have been taught to explore the features of a website to assess its credibility. You may have learned to ask, is this site a .com or a .org? Does the site incorporate advertisements? Was it written by someone who appears to have appropriate expertise? Are there citations to supporting evidence or research? Is the information current? While sometimes useful, these questions can also misdirect you because they rely on superficial markers of credibility and authority. For example, some .org websites may be reliable and nonpartisan while others may be partisan political action groups or even promoters of widely debunked conspiracy theories. On the other hand, some of the most authoritative news websites are dot-coms with advertisements, such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Relying on superficial markers to evaluate credibility can be problematic because most websites won't say, I was designed by a biased political organization with an intent to manipulate you, or I'm leaving out important information that might give you a more objective perspective on this issue, or I was written by an uninformed person with no relevant expertise. So how do we improve our ability to evaluate websites when we know that some individuals and organizations may be working hard to misrepresent themselves and misinform us by using a skill called lateral reading? Lateral reading is a simple concept used by professional fact checkers and other savvy thinkers to judge the credibility of unfamiliar sources. While many of us judge a website by reading vertically, scrolling up and down to look for markers of credibility, or perhaps clicking on links within the site, fact checkers jump outside the site using new browser tabs to seek additional information about the site's credibility, reputation, funding sources, and potential biases. In other words, fact checkers read laterally or horizontally across multiple web pages to get a big picture view of the site they're evaluating. They use Wikipedia, credible news sources, and other references on the web to understand what a source is and how credible it might be. They don't just take the source's word for it. For example, this news story on heavy metal music fan culture is on biz.org, a website that may be unfamiliar to us. But if I open up a new tab, I can search for information about biz.org and find out that it's a news aggregator that often republishes science news from across the web. I can also verify that the research discussed in the news story originated from University College London and PhD anthropology student Lindsay Bishop. By doing some homework on the source through lateral reading, you get a much better sense of what this source is and its level of credibility. We can also begin to think about its strengths and limitations from a more informed point of view. 
In this case, we might decide the information is reliable and a good starting point. But we might also want to look beyond this brief news story and find the original research or other more in-depth scholarly information. With lateral reading, you can move beyond the superficial aspect of website evaluation and develop a more nuanced and more complete perspective on the credibility of your sources. Okay, so then say you want to check something to see if it's true or not. You can actually check the facts. These are websites that um, are popular for checking whether or not something is true, partially true, or false. And these are factcheck.org, politicalfact.com, truthometer, washingtonpost.com, and Snopes.com. And when you search these uh, websites, um, don't just stop at one. It's a good idea if you check out more than one, just to verify that they all come out uh, to have the same result, whether um, it's true, partially true, or false. You can check here, uh, check factcheck.org, and then so uh, people would go to this website to see whether or not uh, these uh, stories are true or not. Another way uh, to check uh, if the news on the internet is true or false, uh, you can look at this ebook by Mike Caulfield. And what you want to do is uh, check for previous work, go upstream to the source, read laterally, and circle back. Something Something that we are all familiar with are memes, and memes have been a popular way of commuting, communicating clever and silly messages over the internet. And usually they are created playfully as a joke, but sometimes without proper context, the message can be misinterpreted. We can see this video to see how memes can spread misinformation. find ways to comment on current events or pop culture. They can also be a way to build a sense of community online. Unfortunately, though, memes have also became a sneaky way to spread misinformation. Take a look at this viral meme. It says, Hi, I don't mean to bother you. The COVID cases are much higher now than before there was a virus. Now, it sounds like the meme is suggesting that the vaccines are what's causing these high number of cases. But is that really what's happening? Time to find out. Is this legit? Hey everyone, it's Pride and welcome back to Is This Legit, a series where we fact check viral misinformation online and teach you ways that you can do it on your own. Before we dive into this fact check though, let's first talk about why memes could so quickly spread misinformation. For one, they're really fast and easy. Second, they're recognizable, making it really easy for people to feel in on the joke and want to share it. They can appeal to a lot of different age groups. And they have the potential to go super viral. But for something to be funny, or at least potentially funny, it can often leave out important context. Think back to the last time you saw a meme site sources or included actual evidence. Maybe never. So when memes take a really complex layered topic and boil it down to 15 words or less plus the punchline, know that there is simply no way that you're getting all the information. And according to this piece from the Washington Post, memes have even been used by extremist organizations to recruit and radicalize young people. It's a really interesting read that I'll link down below in the description. But now, let's dive into the fact check. This meme was shared by a Facebook account called the Free Thought Project 4.0. And according to their about page, they are a hub for free thinking conversations about the promotion of liberty and the daunting task of government accountability. The about page also had a link to their website. Looking through it, they published a lot of articles that just not holding fully self accountable and articles against vaccine requirements. But when it comes to news websites you aren't familiar with, Check that they have editorial standards. 
you want to make sure that they have policies for things when it comes down to their accuracy, transparency, how they handle corrections, and I couldn't find any editorial standards on their website. But back to the coding. This meme was published on January 19, 2022. So let's start off by looking at the COVID cases for that day. Google and U.S. COVID cases January 2022 brought up this tracker from the New York Times, and on January 19, 2022, there were 851,948 cases in the United States. According to the FDA, the Pfizer vaccine was made available to individuals over the age of 16 on December 11, 2020. So let's see what the cases were looking like the day before. And looking back at that same chart from the New York Times, that day saw 225, 225 cases. So yeah, technically we are seeing more cases now than before we had a vaccine. But remember, there are a lot of factors at play here. And just because we're seeing more cases now than before there was a vaccine does not mean that the vaccine is necessarily what's causing these cases, like many have claimed online. This is a good reminder that numbers without context can be extremely deceiving. However, the best way to fill any context is to see what other sources are saying. Turning back to Google, I did a keyword search with the words, can the COVID vaccine give you the virus? And found this myths and facts page from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. A great source when you're looking for medical information. And no, according to the page, none of the COVID-19 vaccines in the U.S. contain the live COVID-19 virus. So you can't get sick with COVID from getting the COVID vaccine. The CDC also states that the vaccine does not cause any. Tweaking my keywords a little and opening up a bunch of tabs, I also found a ton of articles that debunk the claim that the vaccines are what's causing the spike of cases. The real bad in here, the Omicron variant. USA Today debunked the claim that vaccinated people were more likely to get the new variant than people who were unvaccinated. They wrote that according to experts in public health data, the opposite is true. And yes, while the Omicron variant is more resistant to vaccines, People who are fully vaccinated still have more protection and are less likely to be hospitalized or die. But now it's time for our race. We're going to write this meme as need context. Parts of this meme are true, like that we are seeing more COVID cases now than we were in the beginning. But without context, this meme can lead people to believe that the vaccines are what's causing that to happen. And this is something experts have repeatedly said is not true. Remember, check multiple sources when it comes to health information, and watch out for those pesky beds. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Don't compromise, baby. Nowadays, you can see that um, disinformation has become very sophisticated in the form of manipulated media. In order to counteract this, Rudders has teamed up with Facebook to create a free course that helps us identify and tackle manipulated media. We can visit the website to see. So the goal of this course is to help uh, stop the spread of inaccurate and misleading information. Um, basically, it shows um, media can be manipulated. Um, there's a new threat of the deep fake, which is putting fake words into uh, people's mouths. So it looks real, but the person actually never said those words. Um, and what you do is you just go through this course and uh, uh, learn how the media is manipulated. So just because you see it, it doesn't mean it's real. It's very, very sophisticated how the information is presented to us. But when you have time, try to uh, go through this course. An example I can show you here is when you look at these people right here, they look like real people, but in actuality, they are not. They were created. These are artificial faces that uh, the deep learning technology has created. 
So this is the kind of these are the kind of images you may see because you may think that these people are real, but in fact they don't exist. And be careful because these deep fakes can also be used to create false identities. People might reach out to you, try to connect with you, and then you think you're dealing with the real person, but this person was created. This person does not exist. Another tool that you can use uh, is fact-checking images. And what we want to do in for fact for reverse for fact-checking images, what you want to do is do a Google reverse image search. Um, so here is a video about that. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words. But when you're searching for an image online, how do you know that every one of those words is true? We're going to show you a simple trick. You can do it with Google, and it's called a reverse image search. OK, so there are a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, the first one is uh, to go to images.google.com. And you can go over there. You, this, this looks like a normal Google search page, but we have the Google Images icon, and you'll see the little camera search by image icon right here. That's key. Now, one of the first ways, so one of your first of the few options we'll show you today to do this is a drag and drop. So let's say you have an image saved on your desktop. Here it is. I'm just going to drag it right over here into the search bar. We'll upload the file, and I get a whole list of hits where that image uh, is in the, in the page. Um, and so I can then go and investigate all of these different sources where that image shows up. One of the second options you can do is to click the little search by image icon, and you can paste a URL in there. Let's say I found a URL where this, this image I want to search is, and I can paste it in there and search. Once again, I will get a big list of hits of different sites where this image shows up. Let's talk about a third way that is even a little bit easier to do, and this is probably the simplest way uh, and one that I highly recommend. Only if you're using Chrome, though. Um, let's say you're on a web page and you find an image and you want to know more about that image. Uh, you can right-click or control-click on the image and then scroll down here to search, search Google for image. And automatically, a new tab will open up in your Chrome browser, giving you the same results. So the last step you want to do, and the most important one, is probably to ask some critical questions about the results that you just found. You want to ask questions like, on what kinds of websites does this image show up? Are there any clues about where the image originated? Has the image been altered in any way, any place that you've seen it? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. For more information about asking critical questions with the reverse image search, or just about fact-checking in general, Head on over to commonsense.org slash education. The last topic that we will be talking about is uh, the last top topic we will be talking about involves conspiracy theories. Uh, conspiracy theories are very tricky because people tend to see these stories as the truth. Um, an example would be the QAnon phenomenon that many of you are aware of. Um, when people talk about 9-11 conspiracies or um, the birther rumors of uh, President Obama, the whether whether his uh, birth uh, certificate is real or not, um, uh, are vaccines a form of mind control? These conspiracy theories are very dangerous. Um, this tool was uh, put together by Vanessa Otero at a media literacy workshop on conspiracy theories and memes, and. Um, I will read the eight ways that critical thinkers know when a news story is unreliable, disreputable, or embarrassing to share. 
uh, number one, it explicitly states that it is telling the truth and or everyone is lying to you. And these are some examples. Uh, number two, it contains short, conclusory opinion statements. Number three, it organizes, it is organized as a list of questions or a hypothesis. And number four, it puts the burden on you to answer the questions. Um, number five, it asks you to prove a negative, which is imp often impossible. Number six, it suggests an insidious plot by someone media leads, corporations, government, but doesn't say exactly what the plot is or provide any evidence for it. Number seven, elevates the credibility of one expert who goes against the consensus of their entire expert peer group. An example would be one scientist versus all the other scientists. Claims, number eight claims that being taken down for promoting misinformation is censorship, which therefore proves that the item taken down is actually true. So be very careful. Um, when you get information, really, really look at it and see, do these, um, do, do these apply, what, what you're reading, these, um, red flags. If you need help uh, in just looking at fake news and disinformation, you can also access the library's website. I can show you how to find this. This is a libguide. So go to the library's website. And under research guides, you click here. And you can see um, that it's organized in different ways. There's general purpose. Um, there is subject type, subject guide. So it's organized by subject, or it's organized by topic guide. And for us, what we're talking about is uh, fake news and disinformation. So if, if you wanted more information, uh, research help, click here on this. And you can see these are the different resources um, that can help you determining whether or not something is uh, reliable. So for those of you who are watching this workshop for credit, the code word for today is RAIN. So thank you for watching. Hopefully the next time you listen to an interview, read an article, or watch a news story, you will be able to distinguish re between a truth and a non-truth. And if you have any further questions, you can come visit us in person in the library if you are on campus. You can also contact us by phone or through chat if you are off campus.